Welcome to our discussion on ratios, proportions, and a little bit of problem solving, but mainly ratios and proportions. All right, you guys have all seen ratios and proportions before. Uh, anytime you've looked at a new TV, newer ones, being 16 by 9 aspect ratio, that's, that's a ratio, right? And then the older screens are 4 by 3s. Again, that's a ratio. And what specifically is a ratio? Well, simply it's just a comparison of two sizes and it's a way to express the relationship between two sizes um, for things that are somehow related. You know, so for, uh, you know, computer screens and TV screens, we're talking about lengths and widths of that screen and they are in a specific ratio. So a four by three TV aspect ratio means that the width, right, the bottom measurement of your screen is four inches and the top is three inches or as it gets bigger right if the if the vertical was let's say 30 inches then the bottom would be 40 inches that they always hold to that same ratio that that basically the the bottom is one third bigger right if you take a third of three that's one yeah that's four and then they change to these widescreen format uh you know computer screens and tvs and then all of a sudden that ratio became uh, 16 by 9. I don't know if somebody decided to just square both of those numbers or what, but that seems to be the new standard now. And that just means that the bottom width is almost, right, almost twice as big as the vertical, because 16 is almost uh, twice of 9. Okay, so in specific math speak, a ratio is any expression A over B where A and B are somehow related. And we call those things terms. Now, a ratio can be written as a fraction, like A over B, um, sometimes called a quotient. It can also be written with English as just 4, 2, 52, 15, 2, 3, and so on and so forth. And then it can also be written with a colon. So it would be 4, colon, 52. And when you see that, we read that as 4, 2, 52. But... Here's the rub. Just like fractions and how we would always reduce a fraction, right? You wouldn't write a fraction as 10 over 40. You would reduce it to 1 fourth. Same thing goes with ratios because really ratios are just a specialization, a special use of fractions. So you would never write 4 over 52. You would reduce it to 1 over 13. And the same thing with um, 15 to three. You wouldn't write that as a ratio. You would think of 15 to three as the fraction, 15 over three, which reduces to five, which is really just five over one. And so that ratio would reduce to five to one. And you'll notice that that is totally different than one to five, right? With ratios, order matters because same thing with fractions, because isn't 15 over three completely different than three over 15? Yes, right? So order matters. The first number represents something, and the second number represents something else. Remember back to our TV screens. The first number represents the width, and the second number represents the height. So how about something like a ratio of 1 and a half to 2? Well, you would never do this because you would never create a fraction that was 1 and a half divided by 2. That's just silly. You would reduce that. And you go, okay, well, 1 and a half divided by 2, I can rewrite that as 3 halves, right? You remember the, the rule is you take the, the bottom number of the fraction, which is the 2, you multiply it by the whole number, which is the 1, you add the top of the fraction, which is the other one, so you get 2 plus 1 is 3, and 1 and a half is really 3 halves. And then instead of dividing by 2, which is 2 over 1, remember we multiply by the reciprocal, so we flip that and we're multiplying by 1 half. Then you do that math, and you get 3 fourths, and you go, okay, the ratio is really 3 to 4. And that's the, let's say, the lowest reduced form of the ratio. That's what you would reduce it to. You wouldn't go to like 0.3 over 0.4 or anything like that. It's 3 to 4. So ratio should be a whole number to a whole number, and the fraction that it creates should be the lowest reduced form of that fraction. Those are the rules for ratios. So another example, pretty similar to the last one. Again, we wouldn't want to have these mixed fraction things, so we would think of 1 and 2 thirds divided by 3 and 3 fourths. We would convert both of those, right? So you would go 3 times 1 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, that's 5 thirds. 4 times 3 is 12, 12 plus 3 is 15, that's 15 fourths. Instead of dividing, we multiply by its reciprocal, we do the math, and we reduce, and we get 4 ninths. So that ratio would be properly 
um, described as a 4 to 9 ratio. Okay, so it's that simple. Ratios are really nothing more than a um, specialized use um, of fractions. Okay, well then what are proportions? Well, proportions are just a specialized use of ratios, which is really just a specialized use of fractions, right? All this stuff just comes back to fractions. All a proportion is is two ratios that are set equal to each other. So we're basically saying these two frac fractions are equivalent. So A is to B as C is to D is one way to kind of uh, say this in English. But it basically just says A over B equals C over D. And if that's true, then we know their cross products are true. And what do I mean by cross products? I mean this, that if we multiply the top of one fraction times the bottom of the other, that's going to equal if we go in the other direction, right? So C times B has to equal D times A. And in order to keep these things straight, we give them names. We talk about means versus extremes. I'm not going to do a lot of this because it's kind of stupid. Because if you just trade places with these two fractions, right? So if you write it in the other order, all of a sudden the mean becomes A times D and the extremes becomes B and C. So it really becomes these arbitrary rules as to which one is the mean and which one is the extreme. It's stupid. What matters is that you know the cross products are equal. Right? So A times D has to equal B times C. Well, if you've seen any of my other videos talking about how to work with fractions, we already knew this because if we wanted to solve an equation that involves fractions, we solve it by multiplying through by the bottoms of fractions because we want to get rid of fractions. So in essence, all we're doing is that. We're, we're doing this kind of um, common denominator thing. If we wanted to solve this, I would multiply both sides by D because then that would cancel that fraction, right? And then I would have D A over B equals C. And then I could come along and multiply both sides by B to get rid of that fraction. And then I would have D A equals C B and ta-da, that's what we have down here, right? So this is just giving us a specific example of what we already knew how to do, which is Get rid of fractions by multiplying through by the denominator. So try not to think of this as a whole new technique. We're still doing the same thing. We're getting rid of fractions by multiplying by the denominator. Well, if we want to tell if two fractions, um, you know, two pairs of ratios, let's say, form a proportion, we're really just asking, are they equivalent? And we can do that very simply with the bow tie technique or half of the bow tie technique, because what we're doing is we're putting it over a common denominator. So if you just multiply the bottom times the top, so 48 times 3, and then do 4 times 36, if you do that multiplication, that tells you whether or not the same. So any two fractions we can add, subtract, or compare by doing just this cross multiplication, this kind of getting rid of the bottoms, because cross multiplication is really just doing that, right? If I wanted to get rid of this fraction, in fact, if I wanted to get rid of this fraction, it'd be a lot easier to just multiply everything by 48, right? Both sides by 48. That would think we're basically saying, hey, does 3 fourths equal, right? Put a little question mark. 36 over 48. Well, a lot of you would go, well, I would just reduce this fraction and know that the answer is yes. Yeah, that's true. That'd be even easier. But if we multiplied everything by 48, because we always want to pick the biggest number, this is going to kill off this fraction. But 48 divided by 4 is just 12. 12 times 3 is 36. We get 36 equals 36. And yes, it's true. Yay. So this whole thing of checking to see if the means equals the extremes, it's really a waste of time. There's always a quicker way. And the quicker way is just to give them a common denominator. And the easiest way to do a common denominator is to just do a product of the two denominators, right? Unless it's something simple like this where you can look at it and go, well, 48 is just 4 times 12. I can just multiply that first thing times 12. But when you get to something like this, 16 and 22, that doesn't have an obvious, like, one's not a multiple of the other. So instead, if you're, you know, comparing these two things and trying to figure out, is one bigger than the other? Are they the same? Well, then we can do the simple cross multiplication trick and do 22 times 5, which is 110, right? And then 16 times 7, which is 70 plus 42, which if I get my math right, I think that's 70 and 42, that's 112. Those two are not the same. And in fact, by doing this, you see how 112 is bigger? We now know that this fraction is bigger. So not only do we know that they're not a proportion, but we know which one's bigger. 
Okay, um, this is how a lot of textbooks show you is they want you to compare um, the two means and extremes and see that they're the same. Yay, they're the same. All right, let's compare them again. No, they're not the same, right? So no, they're not proportional. It's exactly what we did, but by doing it kind of in a more generic, I'm just getting rid of the denominators kind of technique, we can also tell when something is bigger or smaller. So we don't have to memorize all this stupid stuff of when a over d is smaller than b uh, b times c. Then I know. Uh, don't even bother trying to memorize that. Just know that when you do this simple, really quick cross multiplication of the two terms, whichever product is bigger, well that tells you which fraction is bigger, right? So as long as you're always multiplying from the bottom to the top, then that keeps the um, let's say the the proportions of the two in check as far as when you do uh, the math, you're getting 24 times 3, which is 72. And 72 is the measure of this one. Because it's all about, if we want to do this as a common denominator, we would multiply the left one by 24 and the right one by 4. Yes, I know that's not the least common denominator. I know I could just do the left by 6. But instead, I'm giving you a technique that works for all numbers, because that doesn't work down here, right? We can't just multiply one of them by something. So we just do one technique that works for all of them. Of course, if you get something like this, you can always do something simpler if you see it, you know, and you go, hey, you know what, I don't have to do all this cross multiplication jazz, I can just go this one on the left by 6, and that's going to give me 18, and these things are the same. Or I can do 4 times 18, right, and get 72, and know they're the same that way. But when it's not easy to just do a simple multiplier, then I go, oh, that times that is 3, that times that is 2, and basically what this is, is this is telling me this fraction equals 3 sixth, and this one equals 2 sixths, right? Because we multiplied the left one by 3, the right one by 2, and so now everything would be over 6. Well, 3 sixths is bigger than 2 sixths, so it's pretty obvious that's the direction it goes, right? And we don't have to do any of this silly double cross multiplication stuff and ask ourselves, you know, are they the same? Is one bigger? Is one smaller? Just do the simple multiplication from bottom to top. And the same goes for fraction or sorry for decimals because decimals are really just fractions in disguise. You probably didn't know that, but they are because 0 0.6 is just 6 tenths, right? And this number, well this is the tenths place, hundreds, thousands, 10,000, 100,000 or basically a 1 with 1 2 3 4 5 zeros, right? That's 100,000. And it's always the same number of zeros is equal to the number of things past the decimal, right? I've got five numbers past the decimal, I got five zeros. So this fraction is really the same thing as 5, 8, 9, 2, 1 over that, 100,000. All right. Well, if I want to compare fractions, if I want to know which one of these is bigger, and I have 6 over 10, well, I don't want to cross multiply. I could, right? But I could also just do factors of 10 because it's pretty obvious this has got five zeros, this has got one, so I just need to add four zeros. One, two, three, four, right? One, two, three, four. Now the bottoms are the same. And what about the tops? I have um, 58,921. Over here I have 60,000, right? 60,000 is bigger than 58, so this one's bigger, so this one's bigger. It's that simple, right? But you also, I mean, if you work with decimals at all, you know that it's all about the biggest number in each of the places. So in the tenths place, the six is bigger than the five, so that number is bigger. And if you have fractions where um, they match up for a while, right? So like in this first example, this is really easy because the tenths place is a two. The tenths place is a three, so this one's bigger. Then we get here, okay, tenths place is zero. Same here. Hundreds is a zero. Same here. Okay, so they're still the same. And then here we have a five. Here we have a four. So you see how five is bigger than four. Okay. A zero, a zero, the same. A zero and a one. Oh, so that one's bigger. This one's pretty obvious, right? A three, right? And then so three is bigger. Duh. Okay. So we can... Um, we can use the idea of fractions and we can compare them that way, but it's a lot easier to just know how fractions work.
two zeros are the same place, we look at the third number, five is bigger than four, so five is bigger than that. I mean, it really is just that simple. Okay, how about if we want to solve proportions? Well, we've already talked about solving proportions, that it's it still uses our same concept of just multiplying through to get rid of the bottoms of fractions. Yes, I know there are shortcuts for solving proportions where you do this whole cross multiplication thing and set those equal to each other, and that's fine. If you understand that technique, use it. But here's the thing, that technique only works for the simplest of proportions, something like these. As soon as you add anything to it, if I came along and put plus one here, now you're screwed. You can no longer do the cross multiplication and compare things because you no longer have just two simple fractions. However, if you use my technique of just multiplying through by the bottoms of the fractions to get rid of fractions and basically reset the question back to just a linear question without any fractions and solve it that way, it works for all situations. It works for simple proportions, but it also works when you have that plus one or a plus x or anything else in there other than two simple fractions. So, like I said, by all means, use the simple shortcut when you have proportions, but you should also probably just practice the more general technique for the 99% of the other questions out there that aren't going to be these nice, simple, easy proportions. Right? Because this one's simple. You could just multiply top and bottom of the left by 5 and get 15 over 20 equals w over 20 and then now obviously w equals 15 right but you also could have multiplied everything through by 20 and i would have had 60 over 4 right because when you multiply a fraction by 20 you by anything you only multiply the top by that number and then over here i have w right because if i multiply by 20 it goes away and then 60 divided by 4 just equals 15. same thing well, same thing over here, right? If we want to do this, I multiply through by y, right? Multiply both sides by y, and I get 3y over 4 equals 27. And then I want to get rid of this fraction, so I multiply both sides by 4, and I get 3y equals, what's that, to 80 and 28, so that's 108. And then I want to solve for y, so I divide both sides by 3. And I get y is 36. Would it be faster to just cross multiply and get 3y equals 108? Well, yeah, it would have saved you one step, right? If you cross multiplied, 3y equals 4 times 27, which is 108, would have got you straight to this step. It would have saved you one whole measly step. But you're learning a whole new technique to save you one step, when instead you could have one simple recipe that works for everything, and you don't have to ask yourself, oh, well, when do I do it this way? And when do I do it that way? And when do I do it a different way? And the answer is just, you always do it the same way. You always just multiply through by the denominators, killing off fractions as you go. Always choose the largest number or the most complicated bottoms of the fractions because oftentimes when you kill off one fraction, it'll kill off another. For instance, in our previous example, if we multiplied by 20 to kill off the 20, it also would have killed off the 4, right? Because 20 and 4 reduce. So little things like that will help save you some time. And in the long run, it'll end up being about the same number of steps it would have been if you, you know, did the whole shortcut way that works for this specific type of question or the other shortcut way that would work for this other specific type of question. I'm not a big fan of learning seven different ways of doing seven different types of questions when all seven of those questions kind of live in the same realm and they're all similar enough to be in the same family to use one simple technique to work on all of them. Okay, so yes, this is what our book says. Yes, this is what a lot of textbooks say. Ignore it. Don't do this. You can if you want, but it's just stupid. Just divide, or just multiply by the bottoms of the fractions and go that way, right? So, again, multiply both sides by y. 5y over 6 equals 55, right? Multiply both sides by 6. So we have 5y equals, uh, what's that, uh, 330, I believe? And then divide by 5. y equals 66. Simple. And the the rest are the same, right? There's there's going to be no difference for this one. <clears throat> How about this one? This one feels like it might be a, a little odd, but that's because two and a half. Who the heck does two and a half divided by five? You you remember you can't have fractions inside fractions. I mean you can, but it makes the math really messy and it's really easy to make mistakes. So instead of two and a half over five, convert two and a half to 
either a decimal, because a half is an easy decimal, but instead the better thing is just always make it a, an improper fraction, because that will work for all fractions, you know, like you can't do two and a third as a decimal. So it's better to just always do one thing that works for all of them. So do a mixed number. Two times two is four, right? Four plus one is five. This becomes five halves over five, which is really five halves, right? Divided by five, which is really five halves times the reciprocal of one over five, which gives you five over 10, which gives you one half, right? Because really the fives cancel when you multiply. So this becomes one half equals a over eight. That's an a, sorry, I know it looks like a nine, but that's the same a from up there. So you can, of course, multiply both sides by eight. And I know some of you are screaming at me, just make the left over it. Yes, you could do a common denominator if you wanted to, but we're using the same technique always and practicing that technique so we get really good at it. Eight divided by two is four, and we get, right, the eights cancel, we get A, and there's my answer, A is four. That was pretty quick and easy, right? Because we used the largest number, not only did it kill off the eight, but it also killed off the two. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, go through the, the book ways really quick. You can fast forward this point if you want to, because really, don't bother with this stuff. Just do it, do it the way I showed you. Just multiply through by the bottoms of the fractions and get your answer that way. Okay, the last thing to think about is when we're trying to solve uh, word problems and things like that, um, or we have to come up with proportions, something to keep in mind is that you need to keep uh, track of the units. And really it comes down to keeping track of what's being compared, right? A is to B as C is to D. You're comparing two things that are similar. you got to keep them in the right order. If A is to B as C is to D, sorry, C is to D, then you have to have A over B equals C over D. Or you could flip it, right? You could have B over A is D over C. But, you know, as far as the English is concerned, that would be written as A over B equals C over D. So an example would be, they tell you four cans of cola sell for $1.89 and they want to know how much six cans cost. Well, if I asked you a simpler question, if I said, how much do eight cans cost? What are you doing in your head to get that answer? Are you all just doubling $1.89, right? If four cans cost $1.89, we know eight cans cost twice as much. So you would just take $1.89 and multiply it by two. That's this whole idea of you have a fraction and you multiply it by two, right? And all of a sudden, the four becomes eight and the dollar eighty-nine becomes, uh, what is that, three seventy-nine or something? I mean, because it's going to be half. you got to round up half of a penny type of thing. Because really, you have this fraction of four cans is to a dollar eighty-nine as eight cans, right, is to what? And you know, well, I just doubled it, right? So this is just going to equal 189 times 2, that kind of thing, right? Because all you did was multiply this top and bottom by 2 to get that 8. Well, they didn't ask for 8. They asked for 6. So that's a totally different question because now we have 4 is to 189 as 6 is to x. And we no longer have this easy thing of, oh, I can just multiply the left by 2 over 2, right? So instead of relying on those secondary techniques, use our normal technique, which is get rid of fractions. So multiply through by the bottom. So I'm going to multiply left and right by x to cancel this fraction. And I get 4x over $1.89 equals 6. And then I want to get rid of this. So I multiply by $1.89 times $1.89. 89 and I get 4x equals 1134 and then of course x is just going to equal 1134 divided by 4 which gives us $2.835 right and you can't have half of a penny right so we would say it should cost 284 when you round up okay now, you might be thinking, ah, oh, I don't like having that uh, decimal inside of a fraction, but really, was it that difficult, right? A lot of people would panic and want to do something with that. But seriously, all, all you did was you divided, you multiplied by x to get rid of the fraction with the x on the bottom. Then you multiplied by $1.89 to get rid of the fraction with the $1.89 on the bottom. And, and simple, simple math, right? So um, don't let uh, decimals and things like that make your life difficult. 
they're really just numbers. Work with them as numbers, right? So here's how we do it. We set it up with cans to dollars equals cans to dollars. So this is idea. This is the idea of keeping track of um, units, right? We know that we're comparing cans to their price, right? Cans to dollars. So the new thing also has to be cans to dollars. So that helps us make sure that the six is in the right place, the X is in the right place, which helps us um, do the math correctly. Now this is again, you know, how the book does it with the whole multiplication and skipping steps and all that kind of stuff. But you can see that they got the exact same answer we did. Um, and they round it up just like we did. So that's it, guys. That's everything you need to know for ratios, proportions, and doing simple problem solving with ratios and proportions.